Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you here to Coopersville United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Corey Conran, and I am just so pleased to welcome you to worship today. You know, we've gone through so much in our lives, and especially this week. For some of us, it's been a really great week. And for others, it's been more of a tough week. But the great thing about coming to worship is that all of that, we can lay it at the feet of God. And we can just come and be in God's presence. We can rest. We can be recharged. We can spend some time focusing on God and offering our praises to God. And it's just a great way of resetting ourselves. And so I want to invite you to, to reset yourself today as we enter into this time of worship. I'm really excited today. We get to welcome Pastor Dave Boomgard from All Shores Wesleyan Church. He's going to be bringing us a really great message about what it means to be a loved disciple of Jesus. Make sure you stick with us for that because it's going to be just a fantastic message. And I'm really grateful he's here to share a word of God with us today. As we start, hey, would you just join me in prayer, please? Glorious God, we praise you this day. We thank you. We come to you today with with a week that may have been great and may have been not so great. Uh, some of us are excited and some of us are just tired. And we bring it all to you today, Lord, and we lay it at your feet. And we ask, Lord, that as we worship you today, as we sing, as we hear your word preached, and as we pray that you would come to us, Lord, that you would give us rest, that you would recharge our weary spirits. And that you would encourage us, Lord, to be your church in this world, to go forth and to, to proclaim the love of Jesus to all we encounter. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. We thank you today for this message that Pastor Dave is going to bring to us. And we thank you, Lord, for all the pastors that do such hard work in preaching the gospel and showing their love and their care for their congregations. Thank you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name and all God's people said, Amen. Hey guys, let's let's start by worshiping God through song today.
Hey, good morning. So great that you could be here to join us this Sunday morning. In case you're wondering who the guy on the screen is, my name is Dave. I'm actually a pastor at All Shores. We meet right down the road at the Community Services Building, and I've been friends with Corey for a long time. I've actually had the opportunity to, to preach here once before, but if you don't know me, I just wanted to introduce myself. You know, uh, Corey and I have been friends for a long time, and there's a few things that I know about Corey. One, uh, she loves her church and the people of her, ch her church. She loves her community, and she loves Jesus. You guys are lucky to have her as a pastor, and I hope that you treat her super well and that she has a great vacation. Uh, well, one of the things that we like to do before we jump into God's word is just simply pray. So I'm going to ask you just to take a moment now, bow your heads, close your eyes, just ask God to speak to you this morning. I'm going to give you a minute on your own, and then I am going to pray for us. So go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. God, that you do speak to us. God, we thank you for the beauty of the, of the day, the beauty of this place, and of, for your word, God. We just pray this morning that through your word, God, that you would speak words of life and hope and transformation. God, that we would leave here this morning changed people because of what you are doing. Anything that's just for me today, God, I pray that you would just simply let that fall away. But the things that are from you, the things that are truth, the things that you want to bring to each person here, God, oh, that you would let them stick. We pray these things in the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as I said, my name is Dave. I grew up in West Michigan. Um, I have, grew up with a family of uh, four of us, four kids. We were a blended family. I had three sisters. So yeah, three sisters and just me. So that was rough at times. Uh, but it was interesting, like most families, we would often fight as kids about who was the favorite in our family. And I would often say, my older sister, Joanna, she's the favorite because she's the oldest. She gets to do everything. She got to stay out later. She got to do all the fun things. We all had to wait. So man, she must be the favorite. Then sometimes we would say, my sister, Chris, like she was the youngest, she's the favorite. Because you know, it's the youngest is always the favorite in the family. You know, I think the parents sort of are tired of parenting by then. They give in a lot quicker. They got to do everything a lot sooner. So man, we would say, man, she's the baby of the family. She's the favorite. And then my sisters would kind of gang up on me as the only boy and they'd say, well, Dave gets to do all this cool stuff. He must be the favorite. He's the golden child, which, you know, honestly, I think is kind of true. I think I might be the favorite, but don't tell my sisters. That's just our little secret together. But we would do this. We would just go round and round and fight over who is the favorite. I don't even know why we did it. But I think it's really common in all of our families. In fact, I was watching uh, an old TV show, and I'm, I'm going to show you a little video clip and just to show you how old I really am. This is from The Fresh Prince. So some of you might recognize the video. Some of you might not. But just check out this video now. Hey, big guy, why don't you work today? Well, I decided to take a few days off this week to see what it would be like if I retired early. So that's still a possibility? A very strong one, honey. <laughs> Guys, we have to do something about Dad. Listen, I've tried, but he likes that shirt. <laughs> no, I mean we have to try to discourage this whole early retirement thing. I thought you were all for it. I was, but I've been thinking. If Dad has more time around the house, I'm the one he's going to be spending it with. Why you? I'm his favorite. His favorite what? His favorite child. I'm his little girl. I thought it was obvious. Oh, think again, little sister. You are not Dad's favorite. That's right, Ashley. I am. You? <laughs> hey, it's a known fact that the oldest is always the favorite. Mom and Dad got it right the first time. Then why did they keep trying? Well, you're both wrong. It's me. <laughs> you cost Dad money. I make Dad money. And Daddy's little girl doesn't mean beans next to chip off the whole block, which is me. And Nikki. Nikki's only been around a few years. Daddy hardly knows him. I'm telling you, it's me. <laughs> See, even in the TV series, even in a TV family, we see kids fighting over who is the favorite of a family. I think it's always has been the same. We have fight over who is the favorite, who is the most loved in each and every family. You know, I have three girls on my own now, and I see them doing the same things over and over again. They think daughter number one, my oldest is the favorite, but kind of again, she gets to do the most things, or the youngest, she's the favorite. They go around and fight over this. 
And I've learned just to kind of go with it. And I like to make, have a little fun with it and make a little competition out of it. So I openly declare that one of my kids is the favorite. I'll say, hey, daughter number two, she's the favorite. She's at the top of the list right now. But it doesn't have to stay that way. You can kind of work your way up. You do some extra chores, you bring me some ice cream, you can move up a notch or two. This is a kind of a fluid system here. You can be the favorite if you work hard enough. Now, you can use that trick if you want. Now, I wouldn't recommend it, and please don't judge me too harshly because I'm just joking. I don't really do that. I love all my kids. They are all great kids. And I will confess, there are times that I don't like them very much. You know, when my daughter came home and scratched the car, I didn't like that very much. When I go up to their rooms and they're a mess, like your kids probably keep their rooms immaculate. My kids, not so much. You know, those are times that I don't like them very much, but I love them. My wife and I love them, not for the things that they do, but just that for who they are, because they're our kids, because God has given them, and we love them so much. You know, we try to keep things fair and equitable. I don't really have a ranking system. I do joke with them. But we want each one of them to know that they're loved and they're special and we care for them deeply. We want things to be fair in our society. That's just kind of the way we are wired, I think. So when I was reading through the Bible, I was kind of shocked because I came across this, this phrase, this statement. It said, the disciple that Jesus loved so I was surprised to see that this was in there, in the Bible, that there was a disciple that Jesus loved. And I kept reading it, and I found it five or six more times. Just listen to these. These are all in the Gospel of John. The first one says, One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. And then it says, When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And they said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have him. And it goes on. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon, heard, Simon Peter heard him say that, he wrapped his outer garment around him and he jumped into the water. And then finally we see Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper table and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? The disciple that Jesus loved. That just kind of shocked me because I read that man that there's a disciple that Jesus loves more than other disciples. There's one who's probably the favorite. And I'm going, that just can't be. Now, it's widely accepted here that the disciple that is mentioned is John. John was one of his was Jesus' first followers. He was one of his best friends. He's one of the 12 that were closest to him. And my first thought was, how could Jesus love one of his followers more than the others? So I, I wanted to know more about John. I want to know more about what made him special, what made him worthy of Jesus' love, worthy of what seemed to be make him the favorite. I thought, you know, maybe it's what he did for a living. Maybe it was his profession. And we know that um, he was a fisherman, really, Nothing special about that in this day and age would have been sort of a common job. This is something he did with his, his brothers and his dad. And while well, they must have been somewhat successful at it, because we read that he had some people that worked for them. They, they, were, they definitely weren't a fishing empire. So it was kind of a regular, ordinary job that he had. So we believe that he probably wasn't super educated. He grew up in this fishing industry, and that's what he did. He didn't go on and kind of leave the family business to do something else. Uh, he didn't have any real political power. He wasn't one of the religious leaders of the day, so it seemed like his job didn't lead him to be anything special, that Jesus would love him more than others. I thought maybe it was just his age, you know? You know, he was likely the youngest of Jesus' friends. Maybe that's what made him the favorite, because we all know that the youngest is the favorite, right? We already talked about that. But there really didn't seem to be anything that special about him, or that really worthy of making him the favorite. He really didn't bring anything to able to earn this distinction. And then I realized as I looked at the words that it didn't say he was the favorite. It didn't say that Jesus loved him more than the other disciples. It just simply said that he was a disciple that Jesus loved. What he was, was a disciple. He was a follower of Jesus. A disciple is someone who learns from you, who walks in your footsteps, who, who follows you along and becomes more and more like you. That's what John was. You see, Jesus has met John 
along the shore when he was fishing. And he asked John and his brother James kind of to leave everything, to give up fishing, give up his career and follow him. And John did it. Man, that seemed a little crazy to me on both sides. You know, what did Jesus see in John that would, he would, would make him one of his followers, one of his closest friends? Like I said, it didn't seem like John had really thing, anything to really offer to Jesus to make his life better. He didn't really bring much to the table. You see, Jesus wasn't starting a new fishing company. He wasn't starting a new business where John would be really beneficial in all his fishing knowledge. You know, he was starting, he was coming to fulfill the scriptures. He was coming to teach a new way of life, to really start this movement, a new church, if it were. And uh, John just didn't really bring anything. You know, if he had political power, it would make sense because Jesus might need that to navigate some of those systems. Or if he was a, you know, uh, one of the church leaders, you know, he would have influence with people already. So that would make more sense to me. But he really just didn't have anything. But these letters tell us that John left everything to follow Jesus to be his disciple. You know, that's what made him worthy. It wasn't that he did anything to earn Jesus' love. He simply said yes when Jesus invited him to be his follower. He accepted, he accepted his invitation and he surrendered his life to follow him. He understood Jesus' love for him and he said yes. And really it's that way for all of us. In Ephesians, it says it like this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. See, John, in his faith, accepted the invitation to follow Jesus, and in doing that, he accepted his love for him. You know, there's another interesting point in all of these verses that was really interesting. All these verses that say the disciple that Jesus loved are found in the book of John the letter John wrote, right? John is the author of this letter. John is talking about himself when he talks about the disciple that Jesus loved. I thought that was really amazing. I just admired just his boldness and his confidence. He calls himself the disciple that Jesus loves because he had learned to accept Jesus' love for him. See, when he made that decision to follow him, he did it without having to earn it, just like all of us. He found his new identity in Christ and in Christ alone. I don't know about you, but personally, I can struggle like this. I often get caught up in the trap of really wanting to earn God's love, to do more, to kind of perform better. I want God to love me for what I do. I, mean, I know he loves me for who I am, but I figure there must be more that I have to do to kind of keep earning it, to keep at the top of the list. Even as a pastor, I struggle with this. I often think I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, or I'm not productive enough. I just need to work harder, I need to do more to make sure that I kind of stay in God's love and He loves me. So often I find that I love the work of the Lord more than the Lord of the work. Let me just say that again. I can find as a pastor that I can love the work of the Lord more than the Lord of the work. That's just a little bit messed up. God doesn't love me for how good I preach or how good I counsel or what I do. He loves me for who I am, but I can get caught up in that. I can get caught up in the comparison game, you know? If I could just preach like Corey or if I could be a better leader like John or if I could counsel like Ralph, man, then, then that would be, that would make me better. That would make me more worthy. But Jesus doesn't love me for what I do. He loves me for who I am, his creation. See, John could call himself the disciple that Jesus loved because of his relationship with him, because he was a disciple, a follower, because he had learned to have his identity to be in Christ. Just like all of us, that's where our identity needs to be, not in our jobs, not in our marriage, not in our kids. Our value is not in what we do or what we accomplish. It's in Jesus alone. I love this image that a, that a counselor shared with me. And it's really this image of a gold bar now. One of the show, my favorite shows is Gold Rush. I love to watch them mine gold out of the ground and work for that and kind of take it and refine it. And they make these really pretty gold bars. And then, you know, they're, they're, they're determined to be uh, super valuable. Gold is like $2,000 an ounce right now. But its weight is determined, its value is determined by how much it weighs and what the market is. 
So if a gold bar is worth $2,000 an ounce, that's what it worth. So I can have this shiny, beautiful gold bar, and I can put it in Fort Knox with all these other gold bars, and its value is determined by how much it weighs. Or I can take that gold bar and I can throw it in the swamp behind my house and pull it out, and it could be dirty and mucky and full of grime. And its value isn't any less. Its value is still determined by its weight. That's what determines the value of gold. Our value isn't determined in what we do and how good we look and how we perform. It's in our relationship with Jesus. It's because he loves us. You know, our, the scriptures say that he trades his coat of righteousness for our coat of our rags of filthiness. You know, when we have our identity in him, we become like him. Our value is because of our relationship with him, not what we do for him. See, John seemed to really understand Jesus' love for him and his love for the world. So he went on to write other letters that we find in the Bible, and he wrote a lot about love. We find him talking about love 25 times in the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. I just want to read a passage of that to you right now. Just listen to this. This is in 1st John 4, 7 to 21. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his son, his only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. Man, there is nothing truer in the world right now. Man, we need to love one another because God loved us. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit and we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God as for all of us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we may have confidence on the day of judgment in the world we are like Jesus. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. You see, when we made the decision to follow Jesus, we become his disciples. We accept this unconditional love he has for us. And then we pour that love out to those around us. See, God's love is not transactional. It's not, Father, you did something for me, so now I must do something for you. Or it's not, I'll do something for you, and then you can do something for me. Then you can love me. Then I become lovable. He loves us simply because we're his children, we're his creation, and we're made in his image. You know, there's nothing we can do to make him love us more. And there's nothing that we have done so bad that he won't forgive us and continue to love us. Just listen to this scripture in Romans. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely would anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, he doesn't say, get your life together, get everything right, then come to me. He said, God sent his son for us while we were still messed up, while we were still sinning, and he died for us so we could have a relationship with him. It's not about what we do. It's about who we follow. Romans goes on to say this, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing we have done can separate us. I think often we think, man, you don't know what I've done, Dave. You don't know 
my life. God could never forgive me. Man, I hear that over and over. It's just not true. Christ died for us while we were sinners. We simply need to confess our sins, accept his forgiveness, and live and grow in that love. You see, the reality is, because I decided to follow Jesus, because I became one of his followers, that I am the disciple that Jesus loves. You see, Corey is a disciple that Jesus loves. Patrick is a disciple that Jesus loves. You and you and you. Man, if you've made that decision to follow Jesus, you are the disciple that Jesus loves. Just like John, you can bask in that love. You can have confidence in that love. You can live in that love and love others well because you are the disciple that Jesus loves. I don't know where you're at today. You know, you might be here and you might just need to stop trying to earn his love. That doesn't mean we stop doing good things. We stop working hard. We just still need to do those things, but we don't do them to earn his love, thinking, man, if I do that, then I can be close to God. He wants to be close to you now. Now, So some of you need just to set down the working hard to earn his love and go, man, just bask in his love and spend time with him. Maybe some of you are kind of carrying something around that you just simply need to ask forgiveness for, that you just think, God couldn't forgive me for that. But we've said it's just not true. You just need to spend time with him and ask for that for forgiveness. And he said he will grant it. And some of you, maybe you've never accepted what Jesus has done for you. Maybe you need to take today to commit your life to Jesus. Or maybe even just kind of recommit your life to Jesus fresh and new. And you can do that really simply, just like the scripture said, that God sent his son for us. It's that simple. So maybe you just close your eyes and just say this prayer of commitment or even recommitment this morning. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you of the truth that you sent your son Jesus to come and live on the earth, to die for my sins. That while I'm a sinner, Jesus willingly paid the price for my sins. Father, I accept that truth. Jesus, I thank you for dying for my sins. I admit that I have made mistakes. God, we call that sins. I invite you to come into my life to forgive me of my sins and lead me by the power of your Holy Spirit to follow you. God, I accept your love for me. I live that love and I want to extend that love for, to others. Father, thank you for that. Well, I just simply want to pray for us this morning before you leave and pray that you have an awesome week. Oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the truth of your love, that because of what you've done, because we can be your followers, that you pour out your love on us. God, give us the strength of your spirit to work hard, to do good things, but, God, but not to try to earn your love, not to do it to earn your love. Let's, let us bask in that. And then let that love overflow out of our lives into those around us. Let people know that we are different because we have been with you. Let us live differently. So that as we leave here today, as we go be with our families, as we go in our workplaces, as we go in our community, that we would go and live with the grace and mercy that you give us that we would pour out on others. And I pray this in Jesus' name for each person here. Amen.
shed for me and now thou biddest me come to thee O Lamb of God I come I come That was a great message from Pastor Dave today. I'm so thankful that he shared that with us and I hope you got something out of it. I hope you encountered the love of God just a little bit more today and feel equipped to go and share that with others. Because that's what this is all about is, is to prepare us to share what it is that God has done for us and, and through us. And so church, go forth today. That That's what it's about, right? To go forth and to be those disciples whom Jesus has loved and who's, who he still loves. As we close, I just want to share a few things with you. First off, our offering. Thank you for giving to support the ministry of this church in so many ways. Um, it's because of you that we're able to continue doing this this work, this wonderful God mission of sharing his love with this world. So thank you. You can give your offering online on our Safe Secure Giving portal. You can drop a check in the mail or you can bring your offering to the church anytime we're there. Thank you so much for giving. I also want to share our Vacation Bible School is coming up. We're getting totally stoked about this. It's totally 80s VBS. It's going to take, we're taking a totally tubular trip through the with the early church. It's going to be fantastic. Make sure you mark your calendars August 16th through 20th from 545 to 8 each night that week. Make sure you get your kids signed up on our website. You can go there and get them registered right now so we can make plans for them. And we're going to need volunteers too. And who doesn't love dressing up like the 80s, right? I mean, it's going to be it's going to be a blast. So you can go on our, our website as well and find the sign up to get involved as a leader, as a volunteer for our Vacation Bible School as well. So we can make this ministry a really great one for this summer. So thank you right now for considering that. Make sure you get your kids involved and, and be praying for our, our Vacation Bible School coming up in, in about six weeks now. It's getting really close. So thank you. I want to bless you today. Uh, I hope you enjoy your holiday weekend. I hope you are blessed by our worship today. I cannot wait to worship with you again next week. And maybe consider inviting someone next week to join you, whether, whether you join us online or at our church here in Coopersville. You are welcome and you're called to invite too. So bring somebody with you to church next week. Be blessed, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Amen.
my blessed Savior.